Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Peter Burks. I'm giving a talk today on AKI. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I uh, am a nephrologist at Fraser Health, uh, and I also work with BC Renal in sort of an administrative and, and research capacity um, and affiliated with UBC from the teaching perspective. Um, feel free to cut me off anytime. Happy to take uh, questions, comments. I may not be able to see things if you're putting it in the chat screen and I might have to answer those um, at the end. Um, and yeah, hopefully, uh, we can uh, learn some stuff uh, from my presentation and you find it helpful um, and I'll, I'll get right into it. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, I wanna talk about uh, you know, an intro and background for acute kidney injury and definitions as well as staging. Some um, downstream complications and consequences as you know, that's sort of the why we care about uh, part of it. Um, the association of AKI with CKD, which kind of goes both ways. Uh, AKI increases the risk of CKD and CKD increases the risk of AKI. We'll go through an approach and an etiology of, of AKI, um, workup, uh, treatment and prevention, and, and then some resources. Um, uh, some of this, you know, is obviously AKI stuff tailored towards hospital care, but I'm, I'm trying to take the, the lens of sort of community primary care as, as much as possible, possible in this presentation. So as an intro, uh, AKI is super common, about five to 30% of hospital admissions, depending on the, the data that you look at. Um, two thirds of cases start in the community though. So, um, you know, often, this is a, a community primary care um, issue. And then, you know, when they end up in the hospital, the AKI may have been brewing for a little while. Uh, it does have a strong association with poor outcomes. And, you know, the more severe the acute kidney injury, the uh, higher that association is. Um, it leads to substantial increase in healthcare costs. And a lot of AKIs are preventable. So that is a lot of money that could be saved by uh, preventing or, you know, getting on top of these AKIs quickly and preventing them from becoming more severe. Um, some of the downstream consequences, which I'll sort of go over a few times during this lecture, uh, are chronic kidney disease uh, and end-stage renal disease, uh, cardiovascular disease and hypertension and um, mortality. So definition, really it's an abrupt decline in kidney function over sort of uh, days to weeks, as opposed to chronic kidney disease, which of course is over you know months, at least three months. There is this kind of middle ground that's starting to be talked about called um, AKD or acute kidney disease, which is sort of that in-between stage of AKI and, and CKD, but I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that. Actually, I'm not gonna spend any time talking about that beyond what I just said. Um, so AKI is characterized by an increase in the serum creatinine or reduction in the urine output generally. Uh, the KDGO definition, which is kind of our guideline body for nephrology, um, is an increase in creatinine of, of just 26.5, which is not a huge number within 48 hours, um, or an increase in creatinine of 1.5 times baseline within one week. Um, you can also use a decrease in urine volume, but of course that's a harder one to quantify, especially outside of the hospital setting. Yeah. Um, some of the consequences of uh, this acute reduction in kidney function, of course, is retention of uremic toxins and other nitrogenous waste and dysregulation of some of the functions of the kidney. So fluid balance, uh, acid-base balance, electrolytes, um, and so on. So this is just a, a picture of the KDGO staging of acute kidney injury. So they use um, the baseline creatinine as a reference. Um, stage one or mild AKI is, is somewhere between 1.5 to 1.9. Uh, stage two is uh, between two to, to 2.9 times baseline. That's a moderate AKI. And stage three, which is a severe AKI, is uh, greater than uh, three times uh, baseline or a creatinine value, and sorry, that's the American units, but that's you know somewhere in the mid 300s or the requirement of dialysis. And the staging is important because it does have uh, important prognostic uh, information 
So this is just um, data from uh, Chertow et al. in 2005. And along the um, x-axis, they're showing increases in creatinine. So the first bar is just small increase of 0.3. So that's that like, you know, 26. That's a mild AKI. And, and each one's showing a higher increase in the delta creatinine. Um, these are American values, but one is equivalent to about 100, right? Um, and then along the y-axis, these are a number of uh, outcomes, um, you know, and, and this is consistent across different outcomes like mortality, uh, hospital length of stay, and cost. And, and even these small increases in creatinine do have a significant association with worse outcomes. And then as the creatinine uh, severity of the AKI is worse, that, that association with bad outcomes sort of exponentially increases. Um, but just to illustrate why we care about even these little blips in creatinine is even those small increases can be associated in a hospitalized patient with, you know, over a six-fold increase in mortality. Um, one thing I wanted to say right off the bat is it's easy to talk in terms of GFR. Um, it's, you know, an easy number for us to understand. Patients sort of understand it. But just be aware that GFR is, uh, is a term that's used to uh, discuss patients with steady state uh, creatinine values. So in acute kidney injury, GFR is actually not an accurate um, portrayal of where, where their kidney function's at. And you know, in nephrology, we prefer not to even talk about GFR when we're talking about AKI, we, we use the creatinine. And I'll just give a quick example to sort of illustrate why. So if you have a patient who comes in with a creatinine of 40 at baseline, you know, maybe a little old lady or a smaller person, and they come in sick and their creatinine goes up to 85, you know, that's a doubling in their creatinine. So their kidney function obviously has declined significantly based on that. But if you measure their GFR, you know, it's gonna basically remain in the normal range uh, this whole time. So it's not an accurate um, portrayal of the renal function. I guess another really extreme example would be if I wanted to be really cruel and tie off both of someone's ureters, so they had zero flow coming through their ureters, their GFR at that time, if I, you know, sudden, their, their kidneys are flowing okay, then suddenly we, we tie off both their ureters, their GFR is essentially zero, but their creatinine hasn't built up enough yet to really affect the estimated GFR. So when you measure it, it's, it's not going to be that low. That's, so that's just a way to illustrate that, you know, GFR is not a good Good thing to use an AKI and even creatinine will take some time to build up but but at least it's it is more accurate to day-to-day -day changes um, and and just to give you guys a sense with the changes in creatinine is if someone has absolutely no kidney function and they're about an average sized person you would expect their creatinine to rise by about 100 points a day so that would be you know what we'd call like an anephric rise in creatinine whereas if they have some partial kidney function it'll of course be slower than that Okay, so why do we care about AKI? Uh, it's common, we talked about that. Even mild AKI is an independent predictor of mortality and bad outcomes. And uh, as the AKI gets worse, there's an incremental increased risk of uh, mortality and other downstream uh, consequences. This slide just kind of shows some of those different things, you know, increased risk of cardiac disease, hospitalization, dialysis, hypertension, stroke. So it's associated with a lot of different um, issues and it's something to pay attention to. Um, this schematic uh, is just looking at, um, um, you know, all comers with AKI and sort of what happens uh, over time. So, you know, within, you know, the first 30 days of uh, all patients who get an AKI, about, you know, 10 to 15 of them, you know, these are hospitalized patients are, are gonna be, you know, deceased or pass away. And many of those will probably be the more severe AKIs. And then, so you have, you know, a large portion of survivors in that, in that one to three month phase, a number of them will recover, but a lot won't, you know, a, a minority of them, but not an insignificant number will develop end stage renal disease and, you know, require dialysis or, or so on. And then, you know, this 1.7 million that are left out of that, those 2 million, um, survivors at, at two years, uh, a significant number of them will have uh, advanced CKD by that time. So these people need to be followed uh, over time. And um, basically the risk of uh, CKD is 14 times as high after AKI 
uh, and in those with um, CKD, it's it's um, even a higher risk of progressing to end-stage renal disease because of that AKI. It sort of increases the rapidity of progression in, in CKD patients when they have episodes of AKI. Even mild AKI with renal recovery does have a downstream risk of CKD. But, you know, recovery, of course, is important and reduces the risk, including the uh, speed of recovery. Multiple episodes of AKI certainly increase this risk. Um, so the point is that people who've had an AKI, even if it's a more mild AKI, should be screened for CKD and have their urinalysis and renal function checked three months after the event. This is some Calgary data, uh, just showing the, the cost associated with AKI. So these are all hospitalized patients from retrospective review in Calgary. And if you look at patients who had no AKI, their average hospital cost, you know, obviously being in the hospital is expensive, was almost $10,000. Those with mild AKI, the average cost increased to 12,000. And then those with more severe AKI, you can see it's going all the way up to like $24,000 per admission. So, so there's a huge cost associated with this. Um, okay, so that's some background and kind of hopefully I illustrated the importance of acute kidney injury. Now I'm going to talk about the approach. Many of you will have seen this before, this pre-renal, renal, post-renal. Post it's kind of um, something we hear on our, our medicine rotations and other rotations uh, during our training. Um, and this is kind of um, uh, continued, to be, continued to be the approach we teach. Um, anatomical. So is this happening, you know, before the kidney? Is it something intrinsic uh, to the uh, nephron itself? Or is it something after the kidney that's that's causing an obstruction? Um, this is a busy slide, but this kind of just shows a, a breakdown of the three components of acute kidney injury. You know, the top does show some stuff you should look at on history and physical that I'm not going to spend too much uh, time talking about, because I'll talk about that a bit later. But when we talk about pre-renal or before the kidney, we mainly are talking about either reduced volume or reduced effective circulating volume. So reduced volume, of course, can be blood loss, GI losses, um, burns, anything that, that causes volume depletion. Whereas, uh, you know, the kidney doesn't really care if it's reduced total volume or reduced effective circulating volume. It's just the, the blood flow that it's seeing. So even things like poor cardiac output, where they may be volume overloaded, the kidney still perceives that as low volume. So that's low effective circulating volume and still can cause a, a pre-renal um, insult. And then there's certain uh, medications that, that affect renal blood flow, such as NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs that, that can, um, you know, NSAIDs definitely can cause pre-renal insults. ACEs and ARBs usually more are something that will exacerbate a pre-renal insult that's already caused by some other uh, volume depletion. Um, but, but we do have them there as a potential cause. I don't really consider ACE inhibitors and ARBs as nephrotoxins, but they do modify renal blood flow and autoregulation. So if you become volume deplete, they certainly can make things worse because the kidney can't compensate as well for that. Um, and then cutting over to the far right, we have post-renal AKI. So this can be anything that obstructs the kidney. Um, and uh, reduces the renal function that way. Um, so BPH being probably the most common in, in elderly males, um, medications that cause bladder dysfunction, any uh, urethral obstruction, which can be internal or external, but often is kind of an external compression from, from a mass. Um, to have significant AKI from uh, ureter obstruction, it usually needs to be bilateral unless that person only has a solitary functioning kidney. Um, and then, yeah, other things like stones and, and things like that, they can obstruct. And then the, uh, the renal AKI, so the intrinsic AKI is, is uh, the one we break up into the different components of the nephron. And I'll show uh, an anatomical sort of cartoon on the next slide um, to refresh everyone. But, but uh, for the nephron, at least we have the glomerulus. So you can have glomerular damage and that's usually glomerular nephritis. Um, you can have a damage to the tubules, and we call that acute tubular necrosis was the classic term. Acute tubular necrosis is honestly not the best term because most of the time you don't have actual necrosis of the tubule, you just have injury of the tubule. So we're shifting towards calling that acute tubular injury or ATI, but you'll still see ATN, you know, written all over the place and that's fine. And uh, ATN can be ischemic from poor blood flow. The tubules are very susceptible to injury. Uh, or it can be from toxins such as, you know, myoglobin if the person has rhabdo, um, 
hemoglobin if they have a hemolytic anemia or a tumor lysis syndrome. Um, it can be from um, myeloma cast nephropathy if the little myeloma casts are obstructing the tubule. Um, and then other toxins such as contrast dye, uh, for example, or uh, drugs that can cause ATN, like aminoglycoside antibiotics and, and things like that. You can get acute interstitial nephritis. This is affecting all the interstitial tissue, which is sort of surrounding those nephrons. Um, certain drugs like NSAIDs and um, beta-lactam antibiotics like uh, ampicillin penicillins can, can certainly cause that. And that's almost more of an allergic reaction. But a number of other things can cause interstitial nephritis too. Infection is listed here, but autoimmune conditions can, uh, particularly things like Sjogren's disease. Um, and then there's the vascular damage. So those are the little blood vessels kind of um, surrounding the nephron. Um, you can certainly get vascular injury to the large vessels supplying the kidney. That's like renal artery stenosis and stuff. But you can also get the smaller blood vessels within the kidney can be affected by things like um, TTP um, or HUS, uh, severe hypertension, um, cholesterol emboli after someone's had an angiogram procedure um, and they get little blockages in those blood vessels. Um, high calcium can cause vasoconstriction of those little blood vessels and cause acute kidney injury. Um, so that's, this is kind of the way of thinking. And within each of these sections, we have a whole bunch of different causes, um, which we don't need to know, you know, all of the little nitty gritty, but just knowing the, the general features and, and when to think about pre-renal versus po post-renal versus renal. And a lot of that's going to depend on your history. Um, you know, it's often, you know, evident on the history if someone's obstructed or if they're dry. Um, you know, the physical exam is helpful, but then also the labs, uh, especially the urine tests, you know, if you have more active urine, that's going to bring you towards more of an intrinsic AKI. So if you have blood in the urine or microscopic hematuria, cellular casts, um, you may think of a glomerular disease, especially in the setting of new protein urea. Um, or you, you have white blood cells in the urine without infection, you may think of an interstitial disease. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. This is kind of going through all the same stuff, but showing it from an anatomic approach. So we have the pre-renal stuff that's happening before the kidney and the blood that's getting in there. Um, and then you have all the intrinsic renal causes. This is a picture of the, the nephron, of course, with the glomerulus and then the tubules, the interstitial that would be surrounding this. So we talk about small vessel disease, glomerular disease, tubular injury, and then interstitial injury, which is kind of they don't actually show a picture of the interstitial, but you can imagine that's surrounding this uh, nephron. And then of course, obstruction, which can be you know, uh, intratubular uh, within these uh, small tubules, or it can be in the uh, you know, renal pelvis, ureter, um, bladder, et cetera. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the you know, most common causes of AKI, and those are going to be you know, pre-renal factors, and then at least in hospitalized patients, acute tubular injury. So acute tubular injury is most commonly ischemic, and this is going to be from prolonged um, poor blood flow to the kidney, which ultimately leads to ischemia of those tubules because they're susceptible to that. So often pre-renal and ATI can, can be caused by the same factors. For example, prolonged volume depletion or low blood pressure. It's just that in ATI, this has happened to a severe extent or to a prolonged extent that it actually leads to injury to the tubules. Whereas in a pre-renal injury, it's really just the fact that not enough fluid and blood flow is getting there. So as soon as you reverse that, everything improves. There's no actual injury to the kidney tissue itself. Whereas in ATI, there is injury, so it takes a bit longer for things to recover. Um, one of the important uh, factors in, in um, acute tubular injury is the kidney's ability to autoregulate. So our bodies over time are going to be exposed to uh, various volume states and various blood pressure states. You know, we may become dehydrated, we may get sick. So the kidney is quite sophisticated and has the ability to maintain blood flow and GFR over a range of blood pressure. And the way it does it is it changes the tone of the blood going into the glomerulus and the blood going out, the efferent and afferent arterial. So it can dilate and constrict those arterioles 
to maintain blood flow over uh, various volume states and blood pressures. <laughs> so uh, generally, it can prevent severe uh, kidney injury in that way. However, um, some things can affect the ability of autoregulation, for example, vascular disease in these blood vessels uh, in people who have vascular disease or diabetes or hypertension. Um, severely prolonged hypertension can affect it because that kidney uh, that was previously used to autoregulating over a range of blood pressures is exposed to high blood pressure for a long time. And essentially the set point changes. It's now only used to high blood pressure. So if the blood pressure drops, it's unable to, to deal with that. And then also medication. So for example, if um, the blood pressure is low, the afferent arterial here will normally dilate in order to increase flow. However, that dilation is propagated by prostaglandins. So if you give someone an NSAID, that blocks the prostaglandins and the ability of that arterial to dilate, and therefore it can't deal with changes in, in blood pressure and blood volume as well. The efferent arterial um, alternatively can constrict to allow more blood flow into the glomerulus. That constriction is regulated by angiotensin II, so if you give someone something that blocks angiotensin II, like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, that can also block the ability to autoregulate. And so don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you not to give people ACE inhibitors and ARBs. They're good drugs for heart disease, for blood pressure, even for kidney disease, for chronic kidney disease. It's just that in the setting of hypotension or volume depletion, they can certainly make uh, you know, the autoregulatory uh, properties of the uh, nephron impaired. So, so they should be you know, really held during those, those times. We also have new drugs on the market that are well, not really new anymore, but we have the SGLT2 inhibitors for diabetes that again can affect this autoregulatory mechanism. Um, again, very good drugs and, and good for kidney disease, but in the setting of acute kidney injury, uh, certainly should be held for that reason. So one of the things we often try to do is differentiate, is this just a simple pre-renal uh, insult, you know, that's easily reversible, uh, or do we have acute tubular necrosis or acute tubular injury? One of the ways to differentiate those two things is just response to fluids. You give the patient some fluids, and if it gets better within a day or two, it's pre-renal. Or you tell them to go home and, and hydrate if they're able to with, um, you know, an, an electrolyte-rich um, fluid, and, and it should improve. Whereas if it doesn't, it's more likely to be an acute tubular injury. Um, you know, the urine sodium is helpful. I don't want people to worry too much about, you know, the physiology of urine sodium and urine electrolytes and stuff, because I'm not saying you have to order that on every AKI, but it can be helpful. Um, if you think about someone who is dry or has low effective circulating volume, causing a pre-renal insult, their kidneys are going to want to reabsorb back into the blood as much uh, sodium and you know, fluid as possible. And fluid, of course, follows sodium. So if you just have a pre-renal injury and your, your mechanism and your tubules are working, you should actually have low sodium in your urine because it should all be back in your blood. So the urine sodium should be less than 20 or less than even 10 in, in the setting of a pre-renal injury um, in the absence of anything else like them being on a diuretic or something that's gonna affect the urine sodium. And that's because you've turned on aldosterone and aldosterone causes sodium to move from the urine back into the blood because fluid's gonna, gonna follow. Whereas if you have acute tubular injury, um, you, know, you may not even be dry at this point. It might just be that you have a, a tubular injury so you don't have aldosterone on. Or even if you are dry and you have aldosterone on, your tubules are actually unable to move that sodium back into the blood because they're broken, they're hurt. So the urine sodium ends up being higher. So that's one way to differentiate. The fractional excretion of sodium is just a fancy way of, of calculating the same thing. And instead of, you know, greater than or less than 20, it's, you know, less than 1% or higher than 2%. But don't, don't worry about that too much. I'm not saying you need to order a FINA and do urine lights on every AKI. You know, if someone comes in with a high creatinine and it sounds like their volume deplete, just try hydrating them. And if it gets better, it's probably pre -renal. So the workup for an acute kidney injury, um, you know, it's, it's obviously different if they're an outpatient or an inpatient and, and what patient you're dealing with, but some general tips um, 
first is, is detection. If you have a patient who is at risk, meaning they have chronic kidney disease, um, diabetes, proteinuria, these people are at risk of acute kidney injury. So if they have, uh, you know, the flu or, you know, a stomach bug or some sort of acute illness, it, it's really good uh, to screen for acute kidney injury because they very well may have it and it is uh, important to know. So detection is kind of the first step. Um, much uh, of the time, the cause, as we talked about, is evident on the history. It's, you know, if it's a elderly male who has obstructive urinary symptoms, uh, you know, it's probably BPH. Or if it's, you know, uh, someone who's had, you know, low fluid intake and they're on some diuretics, it's probably pre-renal. Um, you know, that's not always the case, but often, you know, a history and, and physical exam are enough. I know physicals are a bit harder these days with, with uh, virtual care, but, but um, you know, history is, is often uh, gives, gives the answer for the more common AKIs. Um, in patients with AKI, we should, of course, check their electrolytes, you know, see what their potassium is, uh, what their sodium is, their bicarbonate, um, check their creatinine. You can check their urea. Sometimes the urea to creatinine ratio can be helpful. Like in someone who's dry, for example, the urea may rise uh, higher, uh, you know, ratio wise than the creatinine. Um, extended electrolytes um, should be checked because, you know, those can become deranged or things like hypercalcemia can actually cause the AKI. Uh, urinalysis, um, at least a dipstick to look for, for blood and, and protein and leukocytes. And if those are positive, you know, a urine microscopy, or if you have a high index of suspicion, you could go straight to the urine microscopy because there's a lot of information you can get from that that you won't get just from the urine dip. For example, what blood cells are actually in there? Are there any casts? Um, you know, uh, ultrasound to rule out an obstruction is a, is a good idea, especially if it's anything other than just clear volume depletion. Um, just to make sure, uh, we, I've been surprised many times by people who say they, you know, are continuing to pee, but they, but they do have an obstruction. Um, obviously, if the AKI is, is severe enough, you're going to send them in for that. But, um, you know, if it's, if it's not severe that, and you can get an imaging sort of on a urgent-ish basis as an outpatient, that's an option. And then depending on, on the case, you may do further workup. You know, if they do have active urine sediment, they, they, they may need a autoimmune workup for glomerular disease an infectious workup, a toxicology screen, if, if the history indicates a possible ingestion, uh, you know, a, a CK in case they're, you know, have rhabdo, you know, patients who are on statins, things like that. This is a really busy slide, but this is just showing the difference between, you know, the urine dipstick and the urine microscopy. The dipstick, for example, will tell you if there's leukocyte esterase, which is kind of a marker for white blood cells, but it's not telling you how many white blood cells there is. It may help you figure out if there's an infection with the nitrate, but that's only certain uh, types of bacteria. It'll give you some semi-quantifiable protein, but if you really want to know, you need an ACR. It'll tell you if there's hemoglobin, but it won't necessarily tell you what that is. The hemoglobin could be, you know, simply hemoglobin from hemolysis, could be myoglobin from rhabdo, because that also cross reacts with this. It doesn't tell you, you know, whether these blood cells look funny or dysmorphic or whether there's casts. So urine microscopy gives you a lot more information um, in the setting of an AKI. If there are red blood cells, especially if they're dysmorphic, or there's cast that's that's very suggestive of a uh, glomerular cause of uh, the AKI. Remember those those red blood cells as they get squeezed through the glomerulus and the tubules can become misshapen. So that's when we see the dysmorphic cells, or they can become packed together. That's when we see the cast. If you see white blood cells in the absence of infection, that could be suggestive of interstitial nephritis. Um, Hyaline casts, those waxy ones, those are just more can be normal or do they just mean someone's dry? So you can see those in pre-renal. These muddy brown granular casts, these are the ones that are suggestive of acute tubular injury or ATN. Now you don't need these things to diagnose these conditions. It's just that, you know, they're helpful. Um, Renal tubular epithelial cells can also be seen in ATN. I notice in, in BC, at least those aren't commented on that often though. It's just, just highlighting some of the things I said there. Um, so the urine can be quite helpful, but you know, if you have, 
an AKI and it's progressing and there's blood and protein on your dip, you don't need to wait for the microscopy to, to get an opinion from, you know, a nephrologist or send them in, right? Because that's still a high risk uh, clinical picture. Just be aware that hemoglobin or myoglobin can cause the, the blood to be positive on the dip. It's not always, it doesn't always mean there's actual blood cells in there. So the initial management of, of AKI, trial of hydration, and you know, using your, your judgment as to whether you think that needs to be oral or you know, intravenous in the hospital, as long as they're not fluid overloaded, of course. Remember, people who have low effective circulating volume from heart failure, you know, things will get worse if you give them fluid. So just you know, making sure you're thinking about that as well. Um, hold nephrotoxins such as NSAIDs, you know, review other meds too. Um, has an antibiotic been started in the last few weeks that could be causing a reaction? Have they been recently put on a PPI? I think a lot of people don't think about uh, proton pump inhibitors as a cause of interstitial nephritis. Um, allopurinol, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of medications. Um, so if you're not sure, you can you look it up or speak to the pharmacist or speak to a nephrologist. Um, you know, sick day medication management. If you have a patient who's developing a mild, you know, an AKI or dehydration to let them know to, to hold, uh, you know, mainly these medications. So hold their ACE inhibitor or ARB until they're feeling better. Hold their SGLT2 inhibitor, their diuretics, as long as they're not volume overloaded. Um, and then, so those are ones that'll help prevent the AKI from forming. And then there's others that you may hold because they can cause toxicity in the setting of an AKI. That would be you know, metformin. Metformin is not nephrotoxic, but if someone has an AKI and they're on metformin, especially if it's a severe AKI, they can develop a severe lactic acidosis, which can, can make them very sick. Uh, things like um, oral hypoglycemics, like sulfonylureas, if it's a severe AKI, especially in the setting of them, you know, if they're not taking in food or they're vomiting, that can cause hypoglycemia. So that may need to be held, not in every case or other drugs that can accumulate or cause harm in the setting of an AKI, you know, colchicine, for example, um, uh, you know, in, in severe AKIs, you know, anticoagulants and things like that. So, so there, there, there is some, you know, leeway depending on the indication of the drug, depending on how the patient's doing, you may or may not need to hold some of those, but I would say, you know, at least the first four, the ACE inhibitor, ARB, SGLT2, diuretics and metformin should be held in, in any AKI. Diuretics having the caveat, if they're volume overloaded in heart failure, you, you may not hold their Lasix. I mean, I think spironolactone, for example, you would hold any time, though. Um, prevention. So this is, you know, in my opinion, like we can prevent a lot of AKIs just with patient education. I mean, in the UK, they have a whole initiative about preventing AKIs, and they found, at least in their population, only half of patients they asked even knew that their kidneys were responsible for producing urine. So, like, the level of, you know, knowledge around kidney function, let alone, you know, acute kidney injuries is, is very low. Um, so, talking to patients about, you know, the importance of hydration if, they have, if they're at risk or have kidney disease avoiding nephrotoxins and NSAIDs, um, you know, checking about drug interactions, sick day management. I actually give my patients like a sick day form. You know, if you're if in the setting of a dehydrating illness, hold your ramipril, empagliflozin, whatever. Um, identify patients that need closer follow-up. So, you know, the at-risk at risk patients, for example, some uh, regular screening blood work and assessments. You know, a multidisciplinary approach for people who have had AKI, and I know that you know the the primary care networks may be a good um, option here. Um, you know, patients who need contrast dye. Uh, you know, in general, people who have normal kidney function who are healthy, you know, they don't really get contrast nephropathy. But people who have CKD, proteinuria, they, they certainly can. So making sure that you know you recommend prehydration. And then holding the uh, ACE inhibitor ARB, SGLT2, and diuretics for you know three days before and after. Check their creatinine, you know, within a few days after the the contrast dye, especially if it's like intraarterial dye. Um, I would also say certain medications that affect renal blood flow. It 
be good practice to check their creatinine uh, and, and potassium seven to 14 days after starting them. Um, a lot of these medications, we actually expect the creatinine to go up a little bit. That's actually a sign that the medication's working and that's fine. But if it's going up, you know, within a week or two, more than 25%, we may want to, you know, consider stopping it. Um, yeah. So who to send into the hospital? Use your, you know, clinical judgment, of course, but any physiologic evidence of deterioration, rapidly declining renal function, reduced or, or absent urine output. If someone has an AKI and they're not peeing at all, that's that's a really, you know, bad sign that either they're obstructed or the severity of the AKI is it's really bad. So they should be, you know, emergently assessed. Confusion or altered LOC because they could be uremic. Shortness of breath or fluid overload for sure. Uh, moderate to severe hyperkalemia or acidosis. Suspected obstruction we talked about. Suspected progressive intrinsic renal disease like nephritis, you know, then that comes down to that, um, you know, partially your, your history. You know, people with nephritic syndrome, they tend to get, you know, really high blood pressure and then they have the active urine sediments. Um, so those are people who, you know, especially if it's progressive, would need uh, urgent assessment. You know, certain patient, you know, if they're, if they're not presenting like someone who's prerenal or obstructed or they have a history of autoimmune disease or, or nephritis, um, they've started a new medication that may be implicated. Those are all helpful uh, things to figure out. It's not all just based on the, the urine. When to refer to nephrology. So I would you know, suggest urgent referral or urgent communication. And the race line is, is a good option uh, for, urge, for urgent communication. So AKI with active urine sediment, so a red blood cell cast or cellular cast or protein uh, because they may need urgent treatment or a kidney biopsy. AKI in the absence of a readily reversible cause, so just diagnostic uncertainty about the AKI, moderate to severe AKI. Just for your interest sake, these are the kind of our acute indications for dialysis. Um, we use this AEIOU mnemonic, at least in the hospital. So, and this is all refractory to medical management. So people who have severe acidosis, uh, severe hyperkalemia, uh, toxic alcohol, aspirin, lithium overdoses, sometimes severe metformin acidosis, severe volume overload refractory to diuretics or uremia with severe symptoms. So confusion, encephalopathy, People can get pericarditis from uremia. It can cause platelet dysfunction. So bleeding in the setting of uremia. These are all people we would like urgently dialyze um, with AKI, just so you know. Um, this is an area of interest for me is, is people who have had AKI and maybe recovered or not fully recovered and Often these people may end up in hospital or not, and their creatinine comes down, and then we sort of just forget about it. This is, you know, not just nephrologists, but internists, GPs. I think this is an area we could improve on because hopefully I've convinced you with the, what I've shown you earlier that these people are at risk um, for morbid morbidity and mortality and, and for a lot of healthcare costs. So, so providing good follow-up um, education for these people I think would be really beneficial. And we're, we're just not really doing it uh, consistently. And that may be because there's just not a standardized approach or, or an awareness about the importance. It's nothing groundbreaking that I'm telling people to do. It's more just, you know, paying attention and, and monitoring and, and risk factor reduction for future cardiac disease and CKD. So just thinking about people who have had AKI, especially moderate to severe AKIs as a high risk population. Um, multifaceted in intervention, like timely follow-up, regular lab monitoring, you know, medication review, CKD education has been shown to improve outcomes for these patients um, in literature. Um, after an AKI, you know, while we're waiting for the creatinine to improve, we should be monitoring the electrolytes and creatinine regularly until it's stable or recovering. And then, you know, we should certainly screen for CKD at three months with ACR and GFR, as, as I said earlier in the presentation. So remember, CKD can be defined not just by low uh, renal function, but also by, by protein urea.
cardiac risk assessment. So given that these patients with AKI do have a higher risk, you know, paying attention to blood pressure and lipids and glycemic control, exercise, all of these things a little bit more in these patients. One of the big things too is like these medications get stopped during an AKI and there can be, you know, understandably a lot of uncertainty of when to restart them. Like, do you have to wait for the kidney function to go completely back to normal? Do I ever restart them? Um, and this, this can actually have important implications because if someone does have diabetes with proteinuria or cardiac disease, they really will benefit from being back on their ACE inhibitor. So just reassessing the medications regularly. And, you know, I understand that there's not a lot of guidance around this. And I think that's something that needs to be sort of tackled. So that, that brings me to my, my shameless plug. Um, I am trying to take on this issue a little bit in BC. Uh, one of the steps I'm doing is actually, I've partnered with Shared Care uh, through Doctors at BC that, that links GPs with specialists um, uh, to, to you know, provide resources uh, in the province. I'm actually starting some focus groups regionally. So there's gonna be one in Vancouver Fraser, one on the island, and then there's gonna be a North Interior that's gonna have nephrologists, uh, GPs, and some nurse practitioners pharmacists and patient partners really to talk about um, you know, mechanisms for increasing patient and practitioner awareness around AKI. I really wanna hear from the primary care perspective, the gaps in resources and challenges for AKI care in BC and how we can improve that. Uh, and then use this information to develop resources and maybe some online toolkits for, for AKI care that could have you know, patient and practitioner facing uh, um, resources. So we're doing three focus groups to start. Uh, we're hoping to start in March. It's gonna be three hours per session. So an hour of preparation and two hours in the focus group. And it'll be compensated using the uh, BC sessional rate. If you are interested, um, please uh, contact our um, project manager, uh, Cynthia McDonald, her email's there. I do need um, at least one or two more GPs for the Vancouver Fraser group and then for, for across the province. Um, so feel free to email over if you think you would have uh, time or interest in that. These are some resources uh, that I think are helpful. So the NHS in the UK actually um, has a whole initiative called the Think Kidneys Initiative. And they have, uh, they, they actually, that's where I kind of got the idea for a toolkit. Theirs is definitely older, um, but they have a toolkit for GPs, healthcare professionals for, for AKI. Um, so that's a good resource. And there's some patient handouts and things like that. Uh, KDGO uh, does have AKI 2012 guidelines, so a little bit old. And then our BC guidelines, which I helped work on last year for CKD uh, on the BC guidelines website do ha does have some information about AKI and medical management and stuff in there as well. So that is all I had. I'm happy to take any, any questions uh, at this point. Um, so definitely, I see one here, um, I'll answer live is that, um, someone asked, is there a difference between AKI renal impairment and renal insufficiency? I would say AKI is a type of renal. Yeah. I mean, I don't really use the term renal impairment and renal insufficiency very much because those are kind of like not really well-defined terms. Uh, they, they kind of suggest that the kidneys are not functioning properly. Um, AKI suggests an injury to the kidney. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not functioning. Like, for example, a mild AKI is not going to necessarily have any electrolyte disturbance or, or uremic symptoms or, or anything like that. So I don't generally, I, I usually would stick to injury for that. If there is... Um, renal dysfunction, it may be appropriate to use those uh, terms. Um, but in that case, I would, you know, if, if they've approached uh, renal failure, for example, I would call it, um, you know, severe AKI with, with renal failure, or if it's CKD, of course, you know, stage five, that would be, you know, termed um, renal failure. 
so I guess uh, AKI could be considered a type of renal impairment or insufficiency if it's severe enough, but but there, are, if it's mild, I guess I wouldn't really use those terms <laughs> if that answers your question. Um, I know that in coding and stuff, we still see that though. Okay, so the next one is, what is the safe level GFR that you recommend before using SGLT2? I think that that means what level would I not use an SGLT2 if I, just to clarify. Um, so the SGLT2 literature is evolving. Uh, I personally believe that the evidence, you know, given the number of patients in the trial and the outcome data is, is very impressive. And, and I, I do think this, these are game changing drugs for, for um, chronic kidney disease. Um, I would have no upper limit of where I would start an SGLT2 if it was indicated. And by indicated, I mean, you know, anyone with diabetes, um, with proteinuria or diabetic kidney disease, um, anyone with diabetes, with heart disease, really. Um, so I would, I would have no upper limit. I, I actually try to start most of the patients I see with diabetes who are already optimized on an ACE because in the trials, patients were already on an ACE inhibitor or ARB. Um, I usually try to get them on that first and then add in the SGLT2. Um, the lower limit. So I would, I would start it as long as the GFR is above 25, because that would be in keeping with the most recent uh, literature. So the DAPA CKD trial did, um, started as low as a GFR of 25. Keeping in mind that you do expect a slight drop initially, you know, a less than 25% drop, that actually um, correlates with effectiveness of the drug, so that's okay. And I don't stop it. So in the trials, they actually did not stop the SGLT2, even if the patient, you know, ended up on dialysis. Um, there is quite convincing evidence that it slows the decline of the renal function. So I usually, you know, as long as the GFR is greater than, you know, 25 or 30, and it's indicated for them to be on the medication, I start it. I don't go above the doses they use in the trial. So for empagliflozin, that would be 10 milligrams. So for people with like, you know, chronic kidney disease, I keep them at 10 milligrams. I don't push it harder. And I basically continue it on. If they of course have a huge drop in the first like couple of weeks, then I would say that's sort of an adverse effect of the, the medication, or maybe they have some renal artery stenosis that's, that's contributing, and, and I would stop it in those patients. But if it drops you know, a few points, I just keep them on it. And I, I have seen you know, anecdotally that it, it probably does delay progression in a lot of these patients, and especially people with a lot of proteinuria. Um, and I think the literature is quite, quite strong for that. Um, so yeah, I would say I would start it as long as their GFR is above 25. And I don't see any reason to stop it if it goes below 25, as long as you're on the right dose. Okay, so how long does it approximately take for AKI creatinine to return to baseline or have a new baseline? So, that, so that's also a good uh, question. So it, it depends on the, the cause of the AKI. So in a pre-renal AKI, if it's strictly pre-renal with no tubular injury or anything, it really should return back to baseline within a couple of days, you know, two to three days. Um, maybe a bit longer if it's like a super severe AKI, maybe improving by, you know, you know, over a few days. But if it's acute tubular injury, where you actually have, um, you know, injury to the tubular cells, they need to regenerate, or even necrosis to the tubules, that can take weeks or even months. So, you know, we would watch patients even up to three to six months before we say that they haven't recovered or that that's their new baseline in an acute tubular injury. Acute interstitial injury, I would give the same time frame, three to six months. Um, next one is uh, for metformin. What GFR do you decrease it from two grams and when would you stop it? So this is also a good question. Um, I generally will reduce it down at GFR less than 45, personally. Some people won't at that range. Some people don't reduce it till it's at 30. I reduce it at 45, usually to 500 BID. And you know, I would usually stop it between 25 to 30. 
Um, I have seen some people say they're okay going on the 500 BID down to, down to 20. But I think you're, I think it, uh, the safest thing would be to say to stop it at 30. I think it's probably okay to go to like 25, but that's kind of, you'll get a different answer from different people. I would definitely be on the lower dose at that range. Or if you hit 30 and it's rapidly declining, I would definitely stop it. But if they're kind of stable in that 25 to 30 range and you think they really benefit from the drug and they're unlikely to get a severe AKI, it's probably okay to continue the lower dose. Oh, I think I have another one here. Given SGLT, given SGLT2 mechanism action, would you discontinue an SGLT2 if and when the patient becomes anuric? Um, so I think the, yeah, so just, just so people know that the mechanism of action for SGLT2 in, in reducing the risk of nephropathy is, is several fold. Uh, number one is that um, of course, you, you reduce uh, reabsorption of glucose and sodium uh, and you pee it out. So it causes a glucose diuresis as well as a naturesis. Um, so it re reduces your sodium, uh, albeit modestly. It's not a super effective drug for reducing you know, hemoglobin A1C, but it, it acts as a diuretic. So it gets rid of excess volume, helps with your blood pressure. Um, and it also affects autoregulation of the, the kidney. So it reduces the pressure within the glomerulus because of the, the effect it has on autoregulation. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons it helps with nephropathy. It's kind of the same as an ACE inhibitor. It, it affects the, the tone in the efferent and afferent arterial. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, my answer would be if someone was anuric, it's probably doing nothing. So I probably would stop it <laughs> now that you say it. I actually hadn't thought of that until now, but at least in the DAPA CKD trial, they, they didn't stop it at any point. But, you know, if, if someone's anuric, yeah, yeah, I'd stop it. I think one thing to note about the SGLT2s is like, yes, they do act as a diuretic. So you also have to keep in mind like what other meds the person's on when you start it, because they are at a higher risk of becoming a bit dry. So you may need to like, in certain patients, hold their thiazide when you start the SGLT2. Um, if their kidney function is rapidly declining over weeks, then that's probably, it, it may be contributing to an AKI. So you may want to reduce it or stop it. But if it's just, you know, declined a little bit and then continued to slowly decline, it's probably still doing benefit, especially if it's someone with a lot of protein, their kidney function would probably be declining faster if they were not on the SGLT2, especially if they have, you know, ACRs like above hundred, because those people we know do decline really fast, like more than five GFR points a year is their natural history without these interventions. Um, unfortunately, so another question, um, unfortunately, most guidelines still recommend not using SGLT2 if GFR is below 45 to 60. That is true. I think the most recent KDGO guidelines recommend using it. I think those are most recently uh, released. I'm not sure what the CDA guidelines uh, say, but I think there's a KDGO update that would recommend uh, we use it down to, I can't remember if they say 25 or 30 in there. So yes, the guidelines are a bit out of date because the literature has been evolving so quickly. I definitely would not stop an SGLT2 at 45. Like, I think you'd be, um, you know, doing patients a disservice. You know, but do, do be aware that there are risks with these medications. If someone gets really sick, for example, on an SGLT2, you do need to think about things like euglycemic DKA and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm I'm not saying that, you know, everyone's going to tolerate this and, and you still should be aware of, of the risks of it. But, but in general, I think it's a very good um, new drug for reducing glomerular pressure, reducing proteinuria and, 
and reducing renal decline. And it really is a disease modifying therapy. And that's not just for diabetics, right? We we have literature now for non-diabetic proteinuric kidney disease that this is a, that this drug um, delays progression. So I'm starting to use it in my patients with IgA nephropathy, for example, too, if they're maxed out on their ACE inhibitor and still have a lot of proteinuria. So you'll see a lot more use of these drugs, even in non-diabetics. And also in the heart failure world, I think they're starting to use them a lot more uh, as well in non-diabetic patients. So I have another uh, question. For patients with higher creatinines, is the uh, percentage change useful? Yeah, that's a really good question. So if you have someone with a creatinine at baseline of like 300 and you know it goes up to 400, that's you know technically not a doubling in their creatinine, so it's not a severe AKI. So this is one of the limitations of the one-size-fit-all guidelines and staging. Um, I would still consider that patient to be much higher risk than, than, you know, someone with a lower creatinine that's gone up by the same ratio. So um, I guess my answer is not as useful. So the absolute number of creatinine rise may be more useful in, in those extreme patients. And also for, you know, the, the, the other um, one that's important to talk about are the people with really low creatinines. We often don't even notice that they have AKIs if their baseline creatinine is 30 or 40 and it goes to 70 or 80, but that's actually a significant AKI. It just doesn't get highlighted red in their lab results, so we don't, we don't notice it as much. Um, so yeah, definitely no uh, one-size-fits-all uh, for these patients, um, but uh, the staging uh, is generally useful, but keep, keep in mind it has its limitations. Okay, I think we're just at one uh, now. Thanks uh, for listening in and, and hopefully you guys learned some stuff. Um, and hopefully some, you know, at least one or two of you sign up for the focus groups.